In this video tutorial, we're going to be doing a stress analysis or a finite element analysis on the shelf bracket displayed on the screen here. All of the dimensions on this drawing are in millimetres and we have a third angle projection view of the component. So the bracket itself is 150 millimetres by 150 millimetres. It has a width of 25 millimetres and a thickness of 5 millimetres. We also have a radius applied to the outside of the bracket. The radius on the outside is 30 millimetres and the radius on the inside is 25 millimetres, giving us this gentle curve here. So first of all, let's create a component in Fusion 360 and then we can carry out our stress analysis. So here we are in Fusion 360 and we are currently in our design workspace. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a sketch for the bracket. I'm going to pick my work plane and I'm going to begin by producing two rectangles. The first rectangle is going to be 150 millimeters by 150 millimeters. And then to create my thickness of five millimeters for the bracket, I'm going to sketch on the opposite corner and this time I'm creating a rectangle 145 millimeters by 145 millimeters. Like so. I need to extrude the bracket through a width of 25 millimeters so I'm going to finish my sketch, extrude and select my profile, extruding 25 millimeters, like so. Recall that we have a radius of 30 millimeters on the outside edge and a radius of 25 millimeters on the inside edge here. And I could have created that on my sketch before my extrusion. But instead, I'm going to do this now, modify, fill it, the underside edge here has a fillet radius 25 millimeters, like so. And repeating the fillet on the other edge, this one here has a radius of 30 millimeters, like so. Now you will also recall that there were some holes in the bracket, and I'm going to add these now by sketching on this face of the bracket. So I select sketch and pick the face. And I can either leave the bracket in this current position or I can rotate this round to make sure I'm sketching in the right positions. So first of all, I'm going to add a center line. The length of this isn't important at the moment as it's just going to be a construction line. And then I'm going to place two circles or two holes on this line. Now, both of these holes have a diameter of 10 millimeters. You can refer back to the drawing if you wish. So we have a 10 millimeter diameter here and a 10 millimeter diameter here. Okay, next I need to define the vertical heights of each of these. So using the dimension tool, the first one is 45 millimeters from the bottom. like so, and the second is 100 millimeters from the bottom. Like so. Now each of these need to be cut through the object. So I'm going to finish the sketch and I'm going to select extrude and I'm going to select the two halves of each of my circles, like so. I need to change from new body operation to cut, and I need to ensure that each of these cuts goes fully through the part. I could specify a dimension, or I can just make sure I drag that at least through the distance of the part. Then I click OK, and I can see that I have the component produced as per the drawing. Now, before I do the simulation on this, I'm going to switch to the simulation workspace 
and prepare this model for simulation. I'm going to be doing a static analysis. And I'm going to go through the same steps as we did previously. I'm going to assign materials, constraints, and loads. We don't need to assign contacts because we only have one component here. Once again, I'm going to leave the study material as steel. I'm not going to make any changes to the material at this stage. And I'm going to apply some constraints. Now, the constraints I'm going to apply this time is for the inside of each of the holes, I'm going to apply a fixed constraint. What I'm simulating here is that the bolts hold the centers of these holes in position. So here and here, I'm going to have fixed constraints. But when we think about how this is connected to the wall, we can either specify that there's friction between the wall and the back of the bracket, or we can specify that it's frictionless. Now this would depend on the surface we were attaching to and how we wanted to define this problem. But I'm going to specify that this is frictionless. If we assume that the smooth surface of the bracket is going to be positioned against a smooth wall, then we would have a relatively low coefficient of friction there. It's actually the bolts or the screws that are going through the bracket that are holding this in position. So here I'm going to select constraint, I'm going to select my back surface, and I'm going to change this to frictionless. Like so. And then I'm clicking OK. I'm going to apply a load, and I'm going to apply a load of 250 newtons distributed across this top surface of the bracket. So I can go for loads, top surface, 250. And now we can see that the load has been applied to our bracket. Once again, I'm going to run two meshes. I'm going to run a 10% mesh, and then I'm going to run a 3% mesh and see how the results differ. And then we're going to look at how we can create an assembly which includes a second bracket and the shelf itself in order to repeat this stress analysis. So, generate my mesh. And I'm going to solve with the 10% mesh. Okay, what we notice immediately is that our factor of safety is below one. That means that this component would fail or yield. So if we go to our results, we can see that we have a safety factor of 0.9 at the underside of this radius here. This is where the bracket would most likely fail if it was placed under these loading conditions. We can check our results by switching to stress and we see that the maximum stress is 229 megapascals, which is above the yield strength of our steel. Now, before we rely on these results, let's refine our mesh and repeat the study. So if we click Finish Results, we're going to modify our mesh, and we're going to change this to a 3% average element size. We need to regenerate our mesh so that it becomes up to date over here. And then we need to regenerate our results with the new mesh. So solve, solve study. Okay, we still see that our factor of safety is 0.92, so this component is likely to fail. And we see that our stress has changed now to a maximum of 226 megapascals. So we're seeing a difference there of three megapascals with the more refined mesh. When we repeat this study with the two brackets, I'm going to go for a mesh element size of 5% so that we can get the accurate results with the reduced computation time. But what this is evidently showing us is that this component is likely to fail under the stress conditions. We could take these results and we could improve the design of this bracket. And that's what you'll be doing in the practice tutorials for this topic. You'll be investigating using a smaller radius on the curve here, and you'll also be looking at a supported bracket, and you'll see that that greatly improves the strength of this component. But anyway, for the purposes of this video, we're going to produce an assembly, and we're going to repeat this study with a shelf assembly. So if we finish our results, and return to the design workspace, for our shelf assembly, we're going to need two shelf brackets. And I want the outside edges of these two brackets to be placed one meter apart. So modify, move copy, and select my component. I can select free move, remembering to create a copy. 
and I want to position these one meter apart. Now if we look, the dimension that is given is for the front face to the front face. Well, if we want the outside edges to be a meter apart, then we need to allow for the thickness of the component. Now there's a number of different ways we can do this. We could type in the exact measurement into the box or we can use a formula. And the formula would be 1000, which is a meter, but we need to remember to subtract 25 millimeters. Now Fusion is going to have placed that at the correct distance of 975 millimeters. And we're going to be able to check that in a moment. Next, I'm going to create my shelf board. And the way I'm going to do this is by drawing on a face of this first bracket. So zooming in on the bracket, I'm going to create a sketch and I'm going to create a sketch on the front face of our bracket here. I'm going to draw my shelf profile and my shelf is going to have a width equal to the width of the bracket, so 150 mil and a thickness of 25 mil. So I can add my dimensions to that. 150. And now the back of the shelf aligns with the back face of the bracket, which is what we want. Now I can exit my sketch and I'm going to extrude the shelf ball a thousand millimeters or one meter. Now notice at the moment, this is the positive direction for our extrude and this is the negative direction. So in my box here, I'm actually going to type minus a thousand. Now the other thing I'm going to do at the moment, Fusion is trying to join my shelf to my bracket, but I want this to be a new part. So I'm going to select new body and I'm going to click OK. What you'll see now is that the bracket and the shelf board are separate components. We do have a check to perform, and we need to check that on the opposite end, our bracket aligns with our shelf board. Now we can see from here that that is the case. So all of our dimensions and everything are correct. Now, the next thing I'm going to do before we run this simulation is I'm going to specify a material for this shelf board. And I can specify it here in the design workspace, or I can specify it in the simulation workspace. But I'm going to specify it here. So I'm going to go to Modify, Physical Material. And the material that I want to specify for my shelf board is the wood MDF, or Medium Density Fibre Ball. So if I select wood here and scroll down until I get to MDF Medium Density Fibre Ball, and I can just drag that on to the body of the board, like so. You'll notice the colour change to represent that that material is now different from the two steel shelf brackets. So now if I switch to the simulation workspace and look at the study materials here, what we'll notice is that we have the two metal brackets and we have the MDF shelf. It also specifies here that the study materials are the same as the model, so we don't need to do any further changes to the materials they're already specified correctly in the simulation workspace. What we do need to do though is start a new study because we can see that the old load cases still exist on the first bracket. So I'm going to start a new study, another static study, and I'm going to specify the boundary conditions in the same way that I did previously for the bracket with the frictionless back surface and the fixed bolt holes. I need to remember to do this both ends. So if I zoom in on the first end, we have constraints, fixed, and fixed. And I'm going to do this on the other end as well. Fixed fixed. So there's four surfaces or four faces in total that are fixed. Okay, I then need to do the back surface, which I'm specifying as frictionless. So once again, if I rotate this round so that I can pick the back surfaces, constraints, this one here is frictionless. 
This one here is frictionless. Okay. And this time, instead of applying a load of 250 newtons to the top surface of each bracket, I'm going to apply a 500 newton force uniformly distributed across the top surface of the shell. And that force is going to translate down through the brackets. 500 newtons this time, like so. Now, the last thing we need to do is to specify the contact between the shelf board and the brackets. Now, once again, we're going to use the default automatic contact, which will assume that the bracket remains in fixed contact with the shelf board. We could define this in other ways, but for the purpose of this example, we're going to specify those as fixed. So we go for automatic contacts and generate. Next, we're going to apply our mesh. And I'm going to adjust my mesh to be a 5% average element size. And you'll notice the difference when I regenerate the mesh. Okay, let's solve the simulation. And as these results are generating, I just want you to recall the results that we had previously. Now previously we had a maximum stress of around 226 to 229 megapascals, depending on the mesh size that we used. And what we saw was that the component would fail because the factor of safety was below one. What we've done here appears to be a very similar loading condition, but there is one or two differences that we're going to discuss. Okay, so once again, we see that the component is very close to its failure stress. We have a factor of safety of almost exactly one. So we're right on the point of yield of one of those two materials. And in actual fact, we can see that the likelihood is, is that the shelf board is going to be what fails. If we switch to our stress view, what we're trying to do is confirm the results from the previous study. So if we zoom in on our shelf bracket, we want to identify the principal stresses on the brackets and see if they're somewhere in the order of 226 to 229 megapascals. So as we zoom in here, we can see the color coding represented on the bracket. And what we can do is we can begin to adjust that to remove some of the areas where the stresses are much lower. Now what we see here is on the shelf bracket, our principal stresses once again are somewhere in the order of 200 megapascals. And in actual fact, what this is telling us this time is that the maximum stress is 206 megapascals. So can we rely on our results? Well, the difference in this instance is that the load is being distributed across the top of the shelf, and the shelf is also providing some stiffness to that assembly. If the shelf was to deflect any significant amount, then we might see lateral stresses on these brackets. But what the indication is here is that the results are accurate because the stresses are in a similar order, but the shelf is also providing additional stability or additional strength to that assembly and helping to distribute that load. In the practice questions, you're going to be modifying the design of this bracket and you're going to be testing various other different load cases to further understand the complexities of what's happening within this assembly. So I hope you found this video useful and thanks for listening.